Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to um, the 32 event at um, Cork Short Story Festival. It's to celebrate a book um, which um, will be out next year, um, late spring. Um, but you can still buy the book now. So just I'll say this now in case I forget at the end. If you go onto the Unbound site and put in the 32, um, you can still pledge because it's the uh, system is that it's crowdfunded through Unbound, uh, a UK publisher. And the reason for that is that the original version of this book was uh, out in the UK last year, and it was called Common People. And it was a partnership with the publisher Unbound and um, a writer called Kit Deval. Um, Kit um, felt very strongly about the lack of representation of working class writers in, publish, in, in publishing in general, actually just in, 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 in all um, parts of publishing, not just writing. Uh, it became really clear as she entered into that world that um, there were very few people um, of, of the same background as, that she had. And um, she wanted to do something about that. And she made a documentary for Channel 4, um, for Radio 4 rather. And, um, and then it basically snowballed to this huge um, project. Um, she got 30, uh, 32 writers together, 16 uh, established writers, and, um, and then found 16 new writers. Um, um, we, at that point, um, it was in the UK, and even writers from Northern Ireland weren't able to um, participate um, just because of the mechanism they'd set up for new writers, which was to go through writer development agencies. And um, so when the book came out, <clears throat> it did extremely well and got lots of attention brought to the, the issue of working class uh, writers. And um, uh, what they when she went through the festival circuits and, uh, and the press and the reviews um, and she was traveling to Ireland on, she was being asked quite frequently by people, why, why were there no Irish uh, new writers in there and whether there would be an effectively then an Irish version. Um, so this is the genesis of uh, this anthology. I had rung up, um, kits because I know her um, and I'd said you know like oh god you know Irish people so we actually said well then why don't you do it big mouth type thing um, and so um, so that's kind of how I ended up doing it and um, and uh, we uh, basically it took a lot of uh, organizing as you can imagine and but we used the same model was unbound because they had done the first one and they did it so well that you know it seemed um, silly to then try and take the idea somewhere else and also the whole crowdfunding and they have all of those uh, uh, systems set up. And we, I chose as editor, I chose the commissioned writers, um, four of whom are here tonight. And then we found 16 new writers and um, the crowdfunding is basically you, um, people um, uh, just who just pledged um, a small amounts. But we also had a massive injection of money from uh, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, which um, this book just would not have happened without them. So we're very, very grateful to, to them. <coughs> and um, so um, on saying um, there are, we have amazing an amazing lineup. Um, we've got um, Roddy Doyle and Kevin Barry and... Um, Danielle McLaughlin, Lisa McInerney, and um, the writers that we have here tonight to answer some of my questions and to read for the first time uh, some of their uh, piece that they have written for, for the anthology. I'm very excited to hear them read them as well. Um, <clears throat> so if I may just um, introduce those authors to you. Um, we have uh, Owen McNamee. Um, uh, Owen's novels include Resurrection Man, which was made into an excellent film. Um, also, it, the Blue Tiger, which was longlisted for the Booker Prize. And Orchid Blue was described by John Burnside in The Garden as not only um, into a political novel of the highest order, but also that rare phenomenon of a genuinely tragic work of art. Which, um, so we're delighted to have him involved um, in, in, the, in the anthology. Um, we have uh, Senator Lynn Rouen, is a social activist, and she's been a senator since 2016. 
Uh, independent of party affiliation, she is a prominent advocate of numerous progressive causes, including the reform and modernization of Ireland's drug treatment and counselling infrastructure, universal, universal access to education, women's re reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. So we love you. Um, she is a graduate of Trinity and um, has lives in Dublin. <coughs> is that right? And, and uh, your daughter's a nominated a actress. And you, of course, have written your own memoir as well. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, in a little bit. Um, we have Martin Doyle as the books editor of the Irish Times, which he joined in 2007. Uh, he worked in the Times in London and was the editor of the Irish Post. There. He edited A History of the Irish Post, was published in 2000 to mark its 30th anniversary. He was an extra in Father Ted's. And he's been dining out on that ever since, haven't you, Martin? Oh, God bless you. <laughs> and here we have, and finally, uh, uh, Rosaline Madonna, who was born in Sligo and fourth of 20 children, which I can't wait to hear about. Um, spent 10 years working in the Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre uh, in the Violence Against Women programme. Um, she has a BA, two MPhils, and a PhD. Um, yes, I know. And um, she's an activist for the traveller community, uh, writes for the Irish Times, and is a playwright, um, focusing typically on the feminist travel traveller perspective, and as well as commissions from people like uh, Fish Amble. She was also chosen by Colin McCann, the author, to um, adapt his novel, Zully, Zully for stage. So, and... And she has some brilliant news today. I don't know if she can tell you, but it's very exciting. Can you tell us, Rosaline? And on, on mute. Can you hear us, Rosaline? I can. You're on mute. I think. Oh, don't. Oh, there you are. Don't tell anyone. No. <laughs> I am just got a commission from the Abbey Theatre. A commission from the Abbey Theatre. I mean, what a dream come true for any playwright. I mean, yes, I think it deserves a bit of that. So, like, yeah, anyway, so uh, where were we? Right, yes. So I thought it might be quite nice um, to start off with the readings. Start off with a little bit of literature. Um, and remind ourselves that, you know, this is what we can quite often you just get into this kind of debates and things, but actually we're talking about books here and we want to hear some of that art. And um, Owen is going to go first and he's going to introduce uh, his uh, story, um, a piece of memoir, and he's going to then read a short section. Over to you, Owen. Okay, thanks, Paul. You hear me okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> I started this, I just started writing a kind of series of paragraphs and, and postcards, and it ended up being that in a way. Um, it started off with my uh, my grandfather leaving Warren Point Docks in the, in the 20s um, to Pavy in Wales. Um, and the first time I'd heard the word Pavy, selling stuff off the back of a bicycle going through the mining villages, and kind of ended up with um, two friends who were. Uh, fleeing Gdansk uh, during the, 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 the whole um, shipyard riots there and uh, got on a ship bound for Waterford, which they had papers for and uh, because the, 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 um, the husband was Polish um, and the ship was a scab ship that was breaking the, uh, the, the, um, the, the minor strike and ended up in Warren Point instead because it was sneaking coal into England through the back door for which they, they had no papers. Um, and all these things kind of like... like Juggled all these things with some kind of you know, memories of Dublin and a few things that happened last year, and it all pulled in together, if you like. And um, so, I'm just going to read a few of them. Um, I'm going to start off with, uh, if you like, number five, which is a definition of the working class by Karl Marx, which is a distinguishing characteristic of this class is their inability to obtain unhindered ac access to the means of production for purposes of satisfying their material needs. Number six is Secret Language of the Working Class, Monaghan Street, Newry, 1941. A tram carries working women from West Brooklyn and Mill into Newry. The design of the mill is based on Jerry Bentham's Panopticon, a unified design of prisons, factories and schools, 
where the watch become their own watcher, oppression and enlightenment <laughs> in the same model. My grandfather stands at the junction of Railway Street and Monaghan Street. He is selling silk stockings to the mill girls. What service to longing? What service to secret desire? The girls use sign language to communicate in the mill because of the noise. They spell out the word for work. They spell out the word for love. He goes home with a ship canal designed to access goods from the industrial interior. The canal is laid out through farmland, so it looks as if the seagoing coasters are sailing through the fields and are suspended in a reality of their own where the bare ground is navigable. Number seven, housing of the working class, Dublin, January 2019. It's bitterly cold, wind driving the weather up to Liffey, cruel winter. We're on the number 13 bus. A woman with an end of her teller look to her, smacks a needy little girl in the hand. She has two other children with her and a young man who walks up and down the bus on some patrol of his own, as if he knows they're behind the lines and might never get home. She sees us looking and feels she has to explain. She says they're homeless and have been given accommodation for the night, but they have to wait until 10 p.m. to access it. She points to the little girl who has spots of red high in her cheeks and a cough. She's just out of hospital, she says. They get off the bus in the sleety rain and dark at Thomas Street. The little girl blows kisses to us. And number eight is the flight to the working class, Gdansk Warm Point, 1976. <laughs> you met him in Poland and you fell in love. You were pregnant. You obtained the necessary papers to bring him back to Ireland with you. The shipyards in Gdansk were aflame. You were blown like feathers under the giant cranes of the shipyards and of history. You paid the captain of a coal ship for passage to Waterford. You were ill in the sea crossing, the grey waves, the bile. You couldn't leave your cabin, your baby. When you docked, you were in Warren Point, which was not the designated destination of the ship. You were on the wrong side of the Irish border and in the wrong jurisdiction. It was a scab ship, a black leg ship, a blockade runner hired to help break the British miners strike by landing coal secretly. And it landed you pale, sick, wrung out. You waited for them to come on board and send you back to Poland. I think I'll stop with that one there. That was beautiful, thank you. Thanks very much for that. And um, next up, um, Lynn, you're going to introduce your piece to us and then... Yeah, um, so I wrote this piece um, kind of in response to an event this year, I suppose, that happened within my family. We lost my nanny in early lockdown, um, but we were very lucky to be able to have my nanny at home. Um, she was already kind of set up at home in the sitting room for that whole process. So we were lucky enough that we weren't in the position that other families were in, in terms of visitation and stuff. And I suppose at this time now, we're really thankful for that. But what we didn't have for such a big and close knit family was the funeral part in, in the way that we would have. Um, my nanny and granddad have 10 um, children and they're all extremely close and we've grown up um, as one big family. So after that, I decided to set up a WhatsApp group with my mom and all her siblings. And I just put in one question at the beginning and just asked them, um, could they share stories with me about nanny and granddad? And I wanted to, the WhatsApp group ended up with 8,000 words. So I had to do a lot of trimming down to get to this. And um, there's a lot to, to, to talk about with 10 siblings, I suppose, and a lifetime of love and, and history. So the, the WhatsApp group became this piece. Um, and for me, it, it was to recreate the stories that we share in, in after a funeral when we reminisce about our loved ones and the lives that we've had. So I wanted to recreate that. So here it goes. Um, it's quite long, so I, I, I'll only get a, a snippet. Rita breaks the initial silence. Da, do you remember lifting me to open the dresser with the blue doors? And there was a Bertie cake. I was four. Ma was putting on her lipstick and pan stick. She'd even put it on to go to the local shop. Without a pause for our dad to answer, Christine jumps in. Mother in the back hall at the washing machine. She would be mangled up to her knees and clothes. I hated that scene. A glance to Maureen, Christine continues. Mam's water's going outside the local pub and me running home to tell father, who I found in the sitting room talking to himself in the mirror. The other nine siblings are nodding and laughing and visibly searching for the story. Still, they allow their eldest sister <clears throat> to jump between memories. Father carrying me into the sea, dropping me and telling me to swim. He did that a lot. He must have been trying to get rid of some of us. He upturned me in a rubber dinghy at sea, says Rita. 
Christine reminds her that the rubber dinghy she remembers with the, was the inner tube of a truck tyre. Or the time mother bringing a new puppy back to Cabra in a shopping bag on a bike, telling us she had enough animals, as in us. She was giving out stink because the pup fell or jumped from the bag twice and she had to go and get it, says Christine as she reaches out to her ma to wipe her brow. Rita adds that Mr. Redden ran over our dog. That's how the pup came about. Ah, I remember dad gave me a note for school saying, sorry, Christine was not in school. Her mother had another baby and I'm up to me collar and nappies. John looks around the room, slowing his glance momentarily on each child. What about the time Da found the baby's remains as he scavenged in the dump, says Rita. Everyone gives Rita a look for turning the conversation in such a direction. Bernie changing the conversation. <coughs> Remember getting sent to Auntie Annie or the neighbours for a loan till payday. He never passed a dump or a skip. Dad always picked up empty bags. He said, you will always find something to put in it by the end of the day. It would be full of spuds, coal, copper, anything we found on the ground. Mind you, we'd need a bigger bag for the tellies says PJ. He used to bring home lots of Guinness bottles, which we washed and put a fake stamp of a harp on the label so we could get them to the Kappa house to get money on them. For him, not us. We used to look in the local dump for mineral bottles for the same reason. Again, not expecting John to take his attention away from his wife. Rita doesn't await a response. He brought home anything that could be used. Ties, clothes, pots, wire, she says. Bernie, I remember having to hang around at the corner for the lone man to pay him because Dad wasn't to know. And Rita, I remember he got me a lovely pair of navy shoes with buckles, brand new. Only snag was, one was a five and the other was a six, both Chris in. There isn't a frown in the house as, the rem as they remember the old times. The room is like any council estate house in Finglas, except it looks a little smaller with 12 adults and a hospital bed inside. Luckily for the lossies, not many of them grew beyond five foot. He is still the same, always finds a use for things. He was recycling and upcycling all his life, Rita adds proudly as if it's one up on the youngsters today claiming to be green. He used to burn the coating off the copper wire so he could sell it. Christine only has the last word out when Rita's straight back in, typical sisters talking over each other. But the family easily follow. He got socked, sacked from a job for taking two wooden crates. He gave them to his brother Paddy Lossie to use for cots for his kids. Christine says, that's new to me. I didn't think I heard about that before. Rita looks to her dad. He told me that himself, says Rita. I'll leave it there. Lovely, thank you. Do you know when I was listening to, after listening to those two, I really hope they do like an audio thingy book. <laughs> I'll have to talk to somebody because I just listening to you is fantastic. So, um, thank you so much, um, Martin. Um, would you like to introduce your piece and um do your be reading for us, please? Sure. Hi there. Um, so my piece is called Dirty Linen. Uh, the name. It's inspired by actually partly two pieces that my mum and dad wrote for a local journal about Paris history. So my mum wrote about um, an incident that happened 100 years ago around the time of partition, the formation of uh, Northern Ireland, when um, her father, my grandfather, Arthur Pat, was put out of work along with every Catholic in linen mills along the River Ban and eight miles stretch, several thousand um, lost their jobs. Basically, um, a wages clerk for a linen mill was shot dead and the IRA were blamed, even though it turned out to be just um, uh, a criminal home from uh, the United States was responsible. Um, and then my dad wrote a piece um, for the same journal about um, the effect of the Troubles on our community, on our parish in particular. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the recent documentary on Quiet Graves, which is on television, but several of the people um, that were in it, um, for example, Barney O'Dowd, um, were from my parish and uh, members of their family were killed. And, and so one of the people um, that my dad wrote about was Pat Feeney, and he was shot dead um, about 30 years ago. Um, in another linen, linen mill, a linen factory in Donna Cloney, where my mum had worked um, saving money. Um, she was a school dinner lady, but she worked at nights to save up money uh, to open a shop in the linen mill where Pat was shot dead working as a security guard. So the two, putting the two together kind of, um, yeah, gave me the, the title, I guess, Dirty Linen, which is a kind of about sort of, you know, spilling secrets in public, which kind of is 
how I feel kind of writing about, um, you know, my own personal story because, you know, I haven't really written anything before. So it does kind of feel quite exposing or whatever to, you know, to, to tell your own story for once. So the passage I'm going to read doesn't really relate to any of that, but it's, it kind of, you know, it makes sense as part of the bigger picture. My granda, Arthur Pat, was a big influence. He wrote and directed his own plays and was a great storyteller. Visiting them, however, was another form of Vatican roulette. If you were lucky, you got a fireside story, a mug of cocoa and a soda farl with butter and jam. If you were not so blessed, you got five decades of the rosary with all the trimmings. I used to earn pocket money collecting my grandparents' laundry. Granny usually paid in silver coins, but once it was Granda who paid in coppers, prompting me to plaintively ask Mummy whether he understood decimal currency. My first regular job was at my uncle's filling station. When he opened, he received a death threat from loyalist paramilitaries. But he survived and prospered, even if his nephew occasionally confused orders for petrol and diesel. Catholics didn't have to join the IRA or Sinn Féin to pose a threat. Seeking to advance socially or economically was subversive enough. When I was 13, we moved to a bungalow on the other side of the ban. We had a ludicrously large front garden. In truth, a field so full of weeds, the only cure, allegedly, was to plant it with potatoes, the picking of which was delegated downwards. If this backbreaking bending was social climbing, it felt counterintuitive. My lower middle class life had got off to a very unpromising start. Poor Shane, my brother, had it worse. If there's one thing harder than lifting spuds, it is picking flax. A local entrepreneur needed labour and mummy knew just the boy. Forget grinds. Nothing focuses a student's mind like the grind of agricultural labour. Drawing the dole, signing on, doing the double, collecting the brew, social security... The numerous euphemisms for unemployment benefit I acquired isn't quite up there with Inuit words for snow, but it speaks to the centrality of the experience. The first thing I did when I left school was sign on. The same when I went to London after my first year at St Andrews. There was a precariat before the word. My upbringing, my class background, has not completely defined me, but it certainly colours how I perceive the world and understand society. Our sky was lower, our horizons closer. Our first and only family holiday abroad was just before my 16th birthday. That said, we were lucky in that Daddy's parents lived near Courtine, the County Wexford Seaside Resort, and, bonus points, my aunt owned the chip shop, meaning free chips. To replicate that buzz as an adult, you'd need to be a gambler in Vegas. <laughs> At St Andrews, where the heir to the British throne followed in my footsteps, I began to notice posh people. It's wrong to make fun of people because of their accent, but they were commonly called yas. They tied their sweaters round their shoulders, not their waists. They were loud. Even their trousers were loud. I spoke fast and kept having to repeat myself. So I learned to speak more slowly so that English people could understand me. A public school girlfriend insisted on giving me a cutlery lesson before we visited her parents. I was now in a world where what mattered was not which foot you dug with, but how you held your knife and fork. Great. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, some of those issues are going to come up in the questions as well, actually. Um, Martin, so, um, and our fourth um, uh, piece tonight is um, from Rosaline. Now, Rosaline is going to introduce the piece but she has asked me to read it out for her um so rosaline faraway uh give us a wee intro there miss Bazza, um i wanted to write about ethnicity travel ethnicity in in a fluid way and i suppose that idea when you're in a room full of central people and you know there's another problem there but they're not always sure and they know you're in trouble but they don't want to help you so I was that whole idea of how we 
reduce ethnicity to an accent or to an image or a piece of jewelry. Yes. And also, I suppose, I remember I, I wrote the opening paragraph. I was in a car with a sentence friend of mine, and we were driving. And he was saying something to me, and he said, you're not listening. And I said, no. And he said, where are you looking? And there was a sight over the wall. And this the idea that no matter where I go, there's always proper iconography in, in our environment. Yeah, Paul, if you want to go ahead. Okay, and I don't. I think that it's three little bits. I'm not sure they're are they consecutive? Just no. a little, yeah. Just so in case you see, there's a little jump in there, and I'm going to look at you while I read it, Rosaline. Okay. I don't know if you can tell that or not, but just thought it might be quite nice for you to have someone read your own work back to you. Where's that? All right, are you ready? Uh, in my car, the rain is pelting across the windscreen, struggling to find the button for the wipers. Loud beeps from other road users add to my stress. The torrential rain makes the colors of the traffic lights blurry. Lowering the radio, struggling to center myself, my peripheral vision is propelling me to look left. There is a roof higher than the wall that's supposed to hide it. For a moment, my attention is diverted from the traffic, the road and the rain. The entrance of a site is exposed. Emotions conjure up inside me that bring me back to a place where I once was home. There's a tear trickling down my cheek. The tear is for memories of hot days, sitting at the entrance of our trailer with the door open, the smell of mother's homemade bread. The sun making it difficult to see across the site. The tear also ren renders up the fear of when the site was raided. Five o'clock in the morning, the sound of police sirens bursting into the caravan, looking for stolen goods, tax and insurance, drugs, firearms. They pulled my brothers and my father out of bed, trousers and boots, no shirt. Made to stand in the middle of the site alongside 30 or 40 other men and boys of various ages. The women and children, including my mother, are terrified. Two emergency response police burst into our bedroom. My sister and our smaller siblings, some of them infants, are frightened of the guns and the uniforms. One of the guards pulls me out of bed. My sisters tell him my legs don't work. It's too late. They pull my resistance body and I fall to the floor. The chaos outside has gone quiet. The young man in uniform stirs at his colleague, then turns his eyes back to my curled up, twisted feet and hands. He's not sure whether to offer help. His colleague has already reached for my body. This frightens me more. <coughs> on the floor of the bedroom in our trailer, a third officer arrives and calls his two comrades. They walk past my mother. The men are arrested two hours later. In dribs and drabs, they come back into the site in clusters of four or five. Nothing was found. All tax and insurance related to our vehicles were in date. By midday, the media had caught hold of the story. They expected the raid will expose criminal activity. Later in the afternoon, my father had the radio on. We're all gathered around the Guardi are having an emergency press conference. They want to apologize. They've made a mistake. It was the wrong site, the wrong men, the wrong family, and the wrong travelers. The rain has stopped. Pulling the key out of the ignition, home is an apartment. The concrete environment allows for very little air and open spaces. Family, community connection, it's not here nor behind a high wall. There's a woman three doors down. Her surname, but I can't be sure. We look at each other, suspicious. Hoping neither of us will give each other away. 
in the lift, the tight space, searching for a marker, an earring, an accent, reducing our ethnicity to something tangible. The niceties of casual encounters are passed between us. The onlooker, the third person, has no idea of the dynamics that are being played out. Instead, he insists on referring to us as ladies. Our eyes meet at this moment. We catch, we both know this time we got away with it. We fooled the settled man. That's very good. Very good, very good. Right, so um, thank you. I hope you can agree that um, they were really great. We, um, You can obviously read the full stories um, when they're in the book. And there's also um, many, many more from uh, new writers as well, uh, people that we found from all around Ireland um, who um, um, have told their 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 story about class and and what it's meant to them how, how it's affected them and um you know one of the reasons for the book is that you know um that there is more than one story and there is a myriad of experience and quite often you know, in publishing you know there's this sense that you know that we've got that story we know that story so that you know you're only you're a, a group of writers are all just vying for one position. Um, this is not just just in writing, you have it in the arts as well. Like, you know, there's only one gay person on TV at a time or one co female comedian at a time, or you know, you're quite often in different genres that I've worked in. I've, you know, and I've worked in theater and comedy and, you know, you'll find the same arguments about, you know, black comedians or, you know, there, there's the token woman on the pan the comedy panel and the, you know, and there's the same one all the time. So it's this idea that it's the same for working class writers as, you know, there's one story. And I remember um, I, I was in a common people event last year in England and we were talking about this and, and saying how, you know, there was a dearth of working class voices and a guy stood up and said, that's not true, you know, um, you know, the, 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 you know, um, it, it's happened, but there was a uh, Paddy Clark, you know, we're going, well, you know, it was 30 years ago, you know, you know that you're still saying you don't need another one because you have one, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing, you know, you know, so, um, so that's one of the reasons, so there's a huge, huge variety of voices and experience in here, um, and in other, there's similarities, um, I think that come there, there, there are similarities. Um, like a, there's like a language of less when you have less in life. There's something about that. I think, you know, um, that, that people understand and you find each other. Like um, um, uh, Rosaline was talking about. There's kind of little signals and stuff, and you, you know. Um, so I'd like to ask a couple of questions to the panel. Um, the first one, and I'll start with you, Owen. If that's okay. Um, you know, I want to ask is. Were you aware of your class when you were growing up? Some people have told me that they were, but I, I mean, I was very acutely aware. So I was just thinking, were you aware of your class growing up and, um, and what did it mean to you? Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you on. Sorry, I muted myself because there, there, there was a cow mooing out in the field beside me. <laughs> <laughs> I muted it to, to, to get, get rid of it. Um, I've not gone, gone to sleep now, but um, it's funny, you know, listening to Rosaline's piece and actually in, in, in Martin's piece as well, if you get to, 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 to read the whole piece, what kind of struck me is about it is, is, is um, what cuts across that sectarianism, you would have been more uh, deeply aware of, I think, kind of growing up in the North. Um, you know, and, and, and Rosie's talking about sort of coming from a traveller point of view, Martin's talking about coming from a Catholic point of view, and that, that barely restrained anger. And, you know, that was that was more what I was aware of, but it's, it, I don't I mean, it, it, this is kind of observation, is it a, a, a way of casting somewhere, somebody as an underclass? I mean, I read, um, I, I wrote a book a few years ago, a novel which was based on the experience of black GIs in, in, in the North uh, during the Second World War. And I came across a quote the other day from a unionist politician in 1941 saying that they, they, they consorted with the, not to worry too much about the black GIs because they consorted with a, 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 the lower class of women in the North um, uh, from our minority, which of course were, 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 were Catholics. And that's sort of incredible sort of intersectionality, if I'm using that word properly, a grotesque intersectionality of bigotry and prejudice and in, in, embodied in, in, in that statement. So. If, if being aware of your class is a kind of awareness of people looking at you through a sectarian lens and thinking of you as other and as an underclass, well, yes, you know, 
And then what, how did, I mean, if you were in, in that awareness, did, did, it, did it bring with it resentment or ambition or, or, or some, you know, I would say pride um, to, to a certain extent. Um, I've only ever uh, really kind of stuck the boot into it. But I've, I've done quite a bit of reviewing and I reviewed a book for Guardian, a, a thriller by an ex MI5 man who'd been in the North. And it's a hugely sort of patronizing portrayal of a kind of a, a poor South Armagh farming family and, um, you know, the, the, the shrillness of the IRA women and the kind of the, the, the the fanaticism of the Irish man sort of coming up, who, who was the offspring of that family. I kind of thought, well, you know, my grandfather's in South Armagh and he kind of uh, pulled himself up by his bootstraps by sending stuff off the back of a bicycle. My grandmother sent children to college, you know. Those, you know, those were the kind of the, 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 if you like, the people who imbued us with pride in who we were. So no, we're not, I, I, there's never any kind of sense of, of, of shame. You know, just I mean, when when I think back and on what the my parents' class, what or my parents' generation, what they gave us, and and, and that is what they gave us. You know. Hmm. Um. Then what about yourself? And do were you aware of your class going up? And did it? Um. What did it mean to you? Um. I I. I grew up very quickly, so I always wonder what other people mean when they mean grow up. Like, <laughs> you know, so like some people think grown up is like 18 or whatever. I think uh, I was kind of catapulted through um, maybe many ages all at once. Um, so grown up to me was that maybe by 14, 15, I became aware. Um, when I was younger than that, I didn't have an. I always knew when I was being treated unfairly or there was an unjust in something. But I never had an understanding of the class elements of that till much later on. Um, what I do realise looking back retrospectively is I very much uh, associate myself with being um, from Tala, from Killinarden. And it's like that's as far as my identity or my understanding of the world um, went. So um, I even t- like I mean, I love reading stuff in, uh, about like the North South, like none of that entered. None of that entered my arena at all. It's like. I was, I was so removed from the idea of class that I was, what was even more astonishing for me to realize was I was also removed from the idea of a national identity. And that I think is an impact of the class. I didn't know that I was, you know, so I didn't feel like a citizen. I didn't know I didn't feel like a citizen, but yet I knew so little about my country and my history. And, you know, so it's only as I got older, I started to identify as beyond talent, you know, that I have a national identity and I have a, a, a gender identity and I have all these other things. So my life was very much affected by class, but I definitely didn't um, acknowledge that. Um, but I was definitely still fighting against injustices within that class system, within our own community. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. And um, Martin. Same question to you. Were you were class growing up and, and what did it mean to you? I'd say to begin with anyway, dimly aware. Like I grew up in a in a small village um until I was thirteen. I lived in a in a council estate. At that time there was only one council estate in the in the village. Then there were at some point there were two. Um so you know, most people pretty much lived in the in the same cir- circumstances as us. Um there were, okay, there's a shopkeeper who, you know, had his own house above the shop. There was the, I think you were probably aware that the, the priest had probably the biggest or the second biggest house in the village next to the next to the church. And he had a, or there was two or three priests, they had a sort of a, a separate heightened status. I think you were aware of that. And there was, you know, probably the guy who had the biggest house in the village always sat in the front pew at the church. Did I, was I aware of that then or maybe a bit later? I'm not sure. I think definitely what happened was when I went to secondary school and I passed the 11 plus, which is a kind of, a, it's almost like a, a class um, transaction as well, because if you pass the 11 plus, you go to grammar school and then you're sort of on an educational track towards third level university, whatever, and the opportunities that that affords. Um, but I passed the, the, the nearest grammar school uh, was in Bambridge. It was a, a Protestant school, a state school, but effectively a Protestant school. I think it was about 10% Catholic. I said wasn't mixed or integrated. It was diluted, diluted orange. And there I experienced a lot of sectarianism. Um, like, you know, basically to 
far too many of my uh, peers, I was a Fenian, and to be Catholic was to be the underclass, was to be a second class citizen. So that kind of, you know, made me aware of my identity, you know, class and, and religion. You know, I'd say if you're middle class Catholic, you're maybe a little more insulated, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you're a little less engaged, perhaps, in the, you know, what was going on. That's not, that's a, you know, a bit of a generalization, but I, I kind of felt that there were, there were people there who were maybe more well to do, who, you know, kind of kept their heads down and that was their way of, of coping with, with the situation. But I think definitely as time went on, you know, what it taught me was that, you know, um, the state is not necessarily looking out for you and that, you know, you wouldn't trust the, the police. And so I think that definitely has, has a kind of a bearing with your sort of, you know, your, your attitude towards authority. Like I think Stephen Ray um, described, um, he was at Queen's with Eamon McCann um, and he spoke of, you know, looking up to McCann because he treated the authorities with appropriate disrespect. And that was something that I kind of related to. And I think that's, you know, that's a mix of class and um, experience of sectarianism. Absolutely. Um, Rosaline, um, just to remind you the question, um, you know, were you aware of like a them and us, like a, a certain class or, and, and what did it mean to you growing up with that sense? Well, for me, it wasn't about class. Mm. It was about ethnicity mm. and racism, which is quite different to classism. And we were aware of settled people. They were somewhere over there. They were monsters. They were violent. They hated us. And you do your best to avoid them. And, the, I mean, the, we lived in our own bubble. And, and, uh, and also, I suppose, as I got older in school or university, I never, never, I never got lost that sense of, I won't hang out too much or too long with settled people because I will be shamed, I will be hurt, they'll slip up somewhere and they will use the keyword or they would say, but you're not a real traveler. And I said, what the fuck does that mean? What's a real anything? It's a bit like, and maybe Lynn or Martin might talk to us that once you move into a new sphere, it's like as if you're not allowed to identify. You know, it's like, how can you be a traveler and go to university? Or how can you be a, a traveler and be literate? How can you be a traveler woman and be an intellectual? How can you be a traveler and read James Baldwin? Or Tony <clears throat> Morrison. There's a double edge. And one of them are very proud. And you, you yeah. just think about leave me alone. You have your ways, we have ours. But then there's a bit of, particularly in the, in the arts, there would be a kind of a, an idea that a settled person can write a traveler better than a traveler. A non disabled person can write disability better. And this whole idea of uh, objectivity is just a code word for privilege and discrimination 
And it dawned on me the most. And just having confidence that they actually are not taking their nonsense anymore. And then I remember Lynn said it a couple of years back about you don't just work hard, you live hard. You know, you improve. You're always aware that you're, you're improving your, your worth to be in the room with them. You're always aware that will be my, you're in charge. Mm. You're always aware that they resent your ethnicity back at you through their eyes, not through your own eyes. And the last thing I will say, one of the most liberating experience I've had was, you know, people assume you know how to write traveler, or you know how to write woman, or you know how to write disability. I didn't. You have to learn that. You have to learn how to write yourself in. Does that make sense? And that's when when I felt class or ethnicity was often a barrier because there was no room to practice how to write yourself in. And the job would always be given to a settled writer who had read all the books, who knew all the caricatures. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think a lot of what you're describing, you know, um, you know, I, I, I completely related to, though I have no connection to your community, because I think this, there's also so many similarities in the experience, you know, and maybe, I mean, I haven't thought about too much but there, but I was thinking in the back of my head, is it about the lack of power or the, the feeling that you're, you know, that you have no agency and and therefore that's that's the connection. I, I'm not sure, but I, I'll, I'll be thinking long. There's, there's, there's one other thing I wanted to ask. Lynn and Owen and Martin, did you ever feel you were a traitor? You know, that I know Martin, you named your piece Dirty Linen. And I know from within, within the community, you feel, you know, in, uh, my family would I always say, don't come around us when we're drunk. <laughs> don't do that. I don't write about us. They're all very boring. No, I wouldn't write them out of any. But then this, this idea from in with your task or your ethnicity, and if you do write, you're a traitor. Um, me speaking personally. I know exactly what you mean, um, but I, I didn't. I didn't feel I was running the risk of that because I wasn't sort of. I guess I wasn't intending to turn a critical eye on on my own community. I guess maybe in in a very sort of a slight way, I sort of touch on, you know, how you know um, my community, the community that I came from, could be somewhat insular as well. Like for example, we used to always play football, even did soccer and cricket on the GA pitch, the Cardinal Sin against Irish nationalism. Um, and I remember one time I called for a friend um, who I played football with all the time and said, he come and play football? And he said, no, that's a foreign sport. And I was kind of thinking, what are you talking about? You know, you've got a Man United jersey in your drawer at home. Um, so I guess, you know, there's a little, you know, a few elements of that which are sort of, you know, I guess challenging some of the, the sacred cows of, of Irish nationalism or some of the maybe hypocrisies uh, within my own community. But generally, um, I'm probably, you know, pointing the finger out rather than in. So, you know, maybe that's an easier thing to do, but that's, you know, that was my experience. 
Yeah, I think um, I think for me, there has been times that I have felt that and I definitely have to put a lot, a lot of emotional effort into when I speak, because obviously as a public representative, there's so many occasions where I speak about these things and I have Trinity, um, what you're seen as the most elite panel and institution in the country, um, electing me in when a lot of my work then is about poverty and prisons and addiction and there's this real uh, balancing of a tightrope in the middle there about how do I advocate for my community without turning them against me and it takes an emotional toll all the time so I haven't yet felt like a traitor but I think that's only because I have had to work really really hard to make sure I talk about the things in a way that is balanced and fair. I mean, when I wrote my memoir, um, I visited a lot of the family homes in which I knew that the things I spoke about would touch and I gave them the opportunity to read the chapters in the book before the publisher did and if they were uncomfortable. So that's the level of effort <laughs> at, because you don't want to be a traitor, because you don't want to go, oh, yeah, is Noel for you all privileged now with your nice job and your this and your that? It's all well and good now. Like, you, you know, so it's like I've had to work really hard not to be a traitor is basically what I'm saying. I think, um, you know, I sat in family homes and asked permission to write particular things. And what was amazing about the feedback I got, Rosaline, was they... Um, trusted me like some of them said we don't need to read that we've watched what you've done so far and we trust what you're going to write in that book and that was powerful for me um really really powerful and I think it helped me on my journey through writing but I don't um I think that's why maybe I'm moving a little bit into writing some fiction stuff as well because I think if I wrote some stuff as a memoir I'd be less protected so now I'm going to try and tell some stories throughout my career in a different way where I can slightly remove it from particular police people or places you know and set them in different environments and try and tell a story in a different way because some stories still do need to be told um but for the benefit of the people that you're telling them about and trying to do that in a way that's not insulting, I suppose. Owen? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was trying to think about this. I mean, I suppose that when I kind of think back at um, much of, of that kind of thing of betrayal, for me, would have been about almost kind of betraying yourself, that you're constantly been put in positions. I mean, again, I was sort of talking about troubles here, but... I mean, I lived on one side of the border and was crossing the border every day to school, you know, so twice a day. So you're stopped three, four times and you get stopped in the streets in Uri, whatever, by soldiers. And every time you had to have, you had to stand up for yourself. And sometimes you just didn't because it was just, it's, and then the, the, the terrible resentment of being put into that position mm. every day. And then you start to resent yourself for, for not being strong enough to 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 put that face on that you had to. And, and you, Rosie mentioned James Baldwin, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, talking about oppression, I don't have the, the exact quote, but um, if it's done to you often enough, you start to do it to yourself. And you, you start, you know, you start almost behaving in, in a particular way because that's been imposed on you. Um, you know, I remember reading recently, um, you know, a British politician coming out of Belfast in the 80s and been taken up through West Belfast and Army Patrol and saying, well, you know, this, this is very quiet and people are very polite to me. And they don't even notice the patrols. They kind of do they, um, you know, they, they, they walk past them and, 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 you know, don't, you know, there's no sort of shouting at them. Like it, it didn't realise that that was the only way you had of resisting them. It was the only way you had of like, pretending they weren't there. It, it was an act of collective resistance. And I remember we did that. You know? um, so, I mean, it's a betrayal, I think, that not, not of class or of ethnicity or, or of, of religion. or It's actually a betrayal of self, I suppose. Um. Listen, um, really shockingly, um, it's um, eight o'clock. I'm not quite sure how that happened. Something happened. Um, but um, uh, uh, we have to wind up now. And um, I mean, I hope you enjoy those uh, beautiful stories that we heard. Uh, move, some very moving. And um, also the, um, the conversation as well. And um, I hope some of you will go and buy um, the book. You can buy it now. And it will come in the post next year. Um, uh, so do do it now. I mean, why not now? Just in case you forget. Um, but I'm sure there'll be um, uh, some some 
chances to be reminded between now and then. Uh, but let, if you just like thank um, Owen and uh, Rosaline and Martin and Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time out tonight to come and share this and talk to us. And thank you, Cork Short Story Festival, for inviting us. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.